I used to remember when I was in Sri Lanka for so many years. You know, we don't have a change of seasons there, and I always used to think about spring <laughs> in the United States. The grass starting to grow, blossoms coming on the trees, birds singing. <laughs> Now being back here, it's really great to appreciate this. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. <clears throat> okay, over the past six weeks, I've given, or I've taken suttas which deal with what I call the approach to the Dhamma. So far, we haven't really gotten into the Buddha's teaching in itself, or at least most of the suttas, the substantial part of the suttas that we've taken up deal with ways of approaching the Dhamma, how to investigate the teacher, how to avoid making mistakes by accepting teachings and blind faith or on the basis of unreliable, undependable sources like oral tradition or lineage of teachers. Um, abstract logical reasoning. Okay, so these suttas that we've been studying give us different perspectives on how we prepare ourselves when we come to the Buddha's teaching. And now with today's discourse, we enter into the substance of the teaching itself. And in order to be able to appreciate the nature of the suttas, to see them in some kind of orderly manner, it's important to know a very implicit structuring or structure which underlies the suttas. You call it the kind of... It's implicit and that I don't think that there are texts which actually make this distinction explicit, which explain it. So when we look at a large number of suttas and try to investigate what is the purpose behind these suttas, what is the content of the teaching, we can see that the suttas, the discourses, fall into certain distinct categories. And I find a convenient way to treat this distinction in the subject matter of the discourses is by using a classification that comes in the commentaries of the types of welfare and happiness to which the Buddha's teaching is directed. The commentaries speak of the Buddha's teaching as being directed to three types of well-being and happiness. Okay, the first is called Dita Dhammika Atta, which means the good or benefits that come here and now in this present life. And these will be suttas which advocate, for example, the practical measures that will lead people to live together in harmony, in mundane happiness ways to avoid conflict, to establish satisfactory relations between parents and children, husbands and wives. Suttas, texts dealing with right livelihood, texts dealing with advice to kings on how to govern the kingdom righteously and in ways which promote the well-being of their subjects. 
talks to the monks on how to live together harmoniously within the order, how to take care of their mundane tasks. People sometimes think that the Buddha teaches only the way to nirvana. But in fact, if you read the suttas, one is amazed at how vast is the Buddha's practical knowledge in so many different spheres and dimensions of mundane life. For example, and even in the Vinaya Pitaka, when the monks start living in monasteries after living out in the open for such, for, during the very beginning of the order, then the practical problems arose and how to construct a bathing room. And they come to the Buddha for answers and then for advice, and then the Buddha gives them instruction on how to construct the bathroom, how to build the toilet, how to clean the toilet. And then we find the Buddha advising lay people on how to live together harmoniously, happily, in virtuous ways within the relationships of their day-to-day, of their day-to-day lives. Then the second level of the teaching is called Samparayika, or the second benefit of the teaching is called Samparayika Atta. This means the benefit that comes in future lives. And these will be teachings that deal basically with observance of the principle, the law of karma and its results. Here we have to take account of a principle which underlies all volitional action. And this is the principle that any volitional action has a tendency to produce results. These are called the fruits of action. And what governs this process of karma and its fruits is an impersonal, universal, moral law. The law that actions bring about results, fruits that correspond to the ethical nature, the ethical quality of the original action, such that Evil actions, unwholesome actions bring pain and suffering as their fruits in future lives. And good actions, wholesome actions, bring happiness and well-being as their fruits in future lives. And then the third level of teaching is concerned with what is called paramatta, which is the supreme good or the ultimate good. And this in the early suttas is nibbana, nirvana, liberation here and now, which means also release from the round of rebirth from samsara. It's the unique and special function of the Buddha to discover the path that leads to the highest good, the ultimate good, the Noble Eightfold Path that leads to Nibbana. And in a sense, that is the purpose of his arising in the world. And the fundamental, the underlying purpose behind his whole teaching. But the Buddha doesn't teach only the way to Nibbana. But he realizes that sentient beings, people, are at many different levels. And so they have to be instructed according to their particular situations, capacities for understanding. And also we have to note that of these three levels of the teaching, 
each arises upon the foundation of the preceding level. So that, for example, in a chaotic and lawless society, or in a family which is sundered by tense, unhealthy relationships between husband and wife, between parents and children, it's very difficult to observe basic ethical teaching and so difficult to follow the way of wholesome action that will lead to a wholesome rebirth. And if one is not engaging in actions that are conducive to a wholesome rebirth, one can't enter upon the way to final deliverance, to ultimate liberation. And so the Buddha has to begin by laying the foundations, by teaching those principles that lead to well-being and to happiness here and now. And ethically, they very much coincide with the same principles that will lead to a happy rebirth. And then once people are engaged in leading an ethical way of life, a life grounded in generosity, kindness to others, observance of precepts, right livelihood, then they can cultivate the higher practice, the higher discipline that leads to inner tranquility through meditation and then to insight wisdom and from there to final liberation. Okay, so this Suttas that we will deal with now within the, over the next few weeks are texts that explain in different ways this basic law of the moral life, the law of karma and its results. And so now we come to the text which is Majjhima Nikaya number 46, the Maha Dhamma Samadana Sutta which means the greater or longer discourse on ways of undertaking things. Okay, we are on page 408 in the text. Okay, the sutta opens in the Buddha's favorite residence, the Jaita's Grove in Shravasti. And he opens with a statement which sets the theme for the discourse. He says, for the most part, beings have, this people, have this wish, desire, and longing. If only unwished for, undesired, disagreeable things would diminish and wished for, desired, agreeable things would increase. Yet, although beings have this wish, desire, and longing, unwished for, undesired, disagreeable things increase for them and wished for, desired, agreeable things diminish. So this is, in a sense, we could call this almost like the irony of existence in the world. That everybody, all people, by their own inherent human nature, they want to be free from various types of discomfort, anxiety, distress, conflict, worry, pain and misery and they long for happiness, well-being, peace, true joy and bliss. And yet despite this wish, very, very few succeed in achieving this this aim. Even though people might achieve, acquire a lot of wealth, a lot of power, a lot of fame, but still they find themselves plagued with unhappiness. And so the Buddha asks, what do you think is the reason for this? And then 
the monks ask the Buddha to give the explanation himself and the Buddha says he will do so. And now in the next part, starting with paragraph 3, the Buddha now is going to make a distinction between the ways of practice of the worldling or ordinary person and what's called an untaught ordinary person. I translate this phrase now as the uninstructed worldling. Okay, the distinction is between the uninstructed worldling and the well-taught noble disciple, the Arya Savaka. And what characterizes the untaught ordinary person is that this person has no regard for the Aryans, that means the noble individuals, the Buddha himself, the great disciples, those who have transcended the level of ordinary people, those who have developed their moral practice, developed their minds, developed wisdom. And such an untaught ordinary person has no regard for the noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma. To say he's unskilled in the Dhamma, this means that he doesn't have knowledge or understanding of the Dhamma. To say he's undisciplined in it, this means that he hasn't been trained in the practice of the Dhamma. And then the next phrase is really synonymous. He has no regard for the, now, <laughs> I would say true person, Sapurisa, for the superior person, and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma. Okay, and so this type of person because they lack this knowledge of the true teaching and do not have any training or practice in the true teaching, they do not know what are the things that should be cultivated and what are the things that should not be cultivated. And if you want a detailed explanation of the things that should be cultivated and that should not be cultivated with definitions, then you can study on your own, I don't think I put it on the list. Sutta number 115, 114. That is called the Sutta on what is to be cultivated and what is not to be cultivated. Okay, so this person does not know what things should be cultivated, what things should not be cultivated what things should be followed, what things should not be followed. Same meaning. So not knowing this, this person then cultivates the things that should not be cultivated and does not cultivate the things that should be cultivated. And it is because of this that unwished for undesired, disagreeable things increase for him and the wished for desired, agreeable things diminish. And what is the reason for this? Then the Buddha says, that is what happens to one who does not see. In other words, this is a person who is ignorant, without knowledge, true knowledge without training. And so in the simplification of this passage, which I have in the outline, we say simply that this person cultivates what should be avoided and avoids what should be cultivated. And as a result of that, he reaps bitter results undesirable results and misses out on desirable results. Then exactly the opposite is the case of the noble disciple. This is one who has 
the disciple of the noble ones who is one who has regard for noble ones. He regards, he has respect, veneration, esteem for those who are truly noble individuals. The Buddha, the great disciple, as well as for those who are practicing the path of the Buddha. And he is skilled in their Dhamma. He has knowledge of their Dhamma. And disciplined in their Dhamma. Such a person has been trained and is himself or herself observing that Dhamma. And so this person, because they have knowledge, because they have training, so they know what are the things to be practiced. What are the things to be observed? What are the things to be cultivated? And what are the things to be avoided, to be abstained from, to be rejected? And so because they know this, they cultivate the things that should be cultivated and they avoid the things that should be avoided. And because they do so, then unwished for, undesired, disagreeable things diminish for them and wished for, desired, agreeable things increase. And what is the reason for that? This is what happens to one who sees, one who has true, correct understanding. Okay, so in short, The noble disciple is one who cultivates what should be cultivated and avoids what should be avoided. And by doing so, this person avoids the bitter results that come from unwholesome actions and is able to reap the desirable, pleasant results of the wholesome actions. Okay, now the sutta has a somewhat convoluted structure. Now the Buddha, in this passage, he's just laid out a general principle. But now he takes the differentiation to a finer level, a subtler level, by introducing four different ways of undertaking things. In other words, four possible say, ways of life, modes of conduct, ways people arrange their priorities. These four put in the abstract, here we're at 3A in the outline, is the way that is painful now and ripens in future pain. The meaning of this will be elaborated as we go along. The second is the way that is pleasant now and ripens in future pain. The third is the way that is painful now and ripens in future pleasure. And the fourth is the way that is pleasant now and ripens in future pleasure. It's actually, pleasure in a way often it's a, it's a somewhat cheap idea, but the Pali word sukha can mean both pleasure and happiness. And also the word dukkha, which is translated here pain, also means suffering. So I think in the case of the results, Suffering in the case of the first two and happiness in the case of the second two would be more appropriate, more fitting. And we could see in this simple distinction of these four courses a rather interesting discrimination made by the Buddha. First, we have ways of life, principles of conduct, Some are painful here and now. 
others are pleasant here and now. But even though different types of action might be painful, might be difficult to follow, give discomfort, require, observe, um, involve a certain amount of stress, effort, exertion on one's part, Exertion which can be tiring, which requires some degree of struggle and effort. Still, within this whole variety or mass of actions which are painful to accomplish now, one distinguishes those which will ripen in future pain and suffering and those which will ripen in future happiness and well-being. And similarly, there are many types of actions which are pleasant and agreeable to engage in. But of this great mass of pleasant, enjoyable actions, some of these will have painful results, will ripen in future suffering, and other types of actions will ripen in future welfare and happiness. And so a wise person who's going to follow the path of the Dharma has to be able to make this distinction. Generally, the actions that are painful now and that will ripen in future pain, those are easy to avoid, or at least they seem to be easy to avoid, because people... Well, people always have their focus, their eyes, vision focused on the immediate experience of an action, how an action impacts on us right here and now. So if an action, of course, a type of behavior is going to be painful, then naturally one wants to avoid it. And so here the distinction between the results or fruits, whether the results are painful or pleasant, is not so germane, since people will generally naturally avoid the actions which are painful in the pleasant, painful in the present. So they will be very foolish people who will, will engage in them anyway. And similarly, with pleasant actions, naturally people will be drawn to engage in actions that are pleasurable and enjoyable here and now without distinction between the results. So the real testing point, the acid test, by which one can distinguish the foolish person and the wise person, is with the two courses of action in the middle. The way which is pleasant now, but ripens in future suffering. That is where the foolish person gets drawn in, seduced, sucked in, and engages in those actions and then lays the foundation thereby for future suffering. Whereas the person with wisdom who understands the law of karmic cause and effect will recognize that even though these actions might give pleasant enjoyment, but they will ripen in future suffering. And then the other testing point is course number three, the action which is painful now, is difficult now, but ripens in future pleasure. This, the foolish person will avoid, because he doesn't want to bring any present difficulties upon himself. He likes to lead a comfortable, easy life, a self-indulgent life, without regard for the long-term consequences. But the wise person focuses his or her mind on the long-term consequences and realizes that even though a particular course of action is now difficult and demands effort, struggle. This way of action will bring 
greater benefits in the future. So, when a person takes up precepts, for example, this, for many people, it involves some degree of conflict or struggle. They have to, now they have to control their own natural disposition. Now, if one takes the precept to avoid taking life, one doesn't go hunting and fishing for enjoyment. When, even when insects come into the house, one doesn't immediately go for the insect spray and try to kill them, but one tries to get rid of them by sweeping them out, by setting up barriers to them. During the summer, when mosquitoes land on the skin, one doesn't just thoughtlessly go and slap it. One will blow it away. <laughs> and then one has to be very conscientious when it comes to others' possessions. Maybe one doesn't have the tendency to become a thief, but one doesn't want to take any risk in illegally or unscrupulously taking, appropriate, misappropriating the belongings of others. And a person who might have strong lustful tendencies will have to restrain his lust to remain within the bounds of the third precept. And a person who might find it easy to get along by telling lies to excuse his misdemeanors and um, telling t- tall tales to impress others will now have to be very mindful of his speech and one doesn't go to taverns and bars and parties and enjoy the finest scotch whiskey and wine, vintage wine. And for a person who's been accustomed to such indulgence, this will be painful or difficult. But when one takes up the precepts, so it's difficult at the beginning, one finds as time goes on that they will give greater happiness and peace to the mind right here and now. So one eventually comes to experience the kind of happiness that one couldn't experience without the precepts. And by observing these precepts, one is creating very powerful, wholesome karma, which in future lives will bring one further and further along the spiritual path and bring all sorts of benefits in the future. Okay, so within these four ways, we can see that the testing points for the distinguishing the wise person from the foolish person are the second and the third. But as the Sutta will show, that there are some really foolish people who follow the first and avoid even the fourth. Okay, so now we come back to the text, paragraph six. Okay, so the ignorant person does not understand the way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in future pain. So, not understanding this, this person cultivates such a course of behavior, does not avoid it, and because of cultivating it, then the undesirable, unwished for, disagreeable fruits of those unwholesome actions bounce back to him, come to him. And as a result, disagreeable things increase and the agreeable things diminish. And the reason this is what happens to one who does not see. Okay, and then for the next, the way which is pleasant now and ripens in the future as pain, here the ignorant person, not understanding it as it is, cultivates it, does not avoid it, and as a result of doing so, again the undesirable things increase and the desirable things diminish. Then the third course, the ignorant person, that this is the course that is painful now, but ripens in future happiness, 
this caused the ignorant person not understanding it does not, uh, not understanding it, he does not cultivate it, but avoids it. And because he does so, then the unwished for disagreeable things increase for him, and the wish for agreeable things diminish. Then the fourth course, the ignorant person, not understanding the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now, and ripens in the future as pleasure, not no, understanding this, this one does not cultivate that path, but avoids it. And because of doing so, the unwished for, undesirable things diminish, and the desirable, wished for things increase. Okay, all of this is the result of ignorance, of not seeing and understanding this fundamental law that underlies all volitional action. Not understanding the law that actions bring results that correspond to the ethical nature of the action. And not understanding the distinction between wholesome actions and unwholesome actions not understanding what ways of conduct should be cultivated, what should not be cultivated. And this is the case for people who don't have access to the Dhamma, the teaching of the Noble One. So generally in the world, I would say, amongst people with some religious allegiance, or even with many people who have no particular religious affiliation, but some higher sense of conscience will be a fairly reliable intuition as to what types of behavior are ethical, what unethical, what types of action should be cultivated, what should be avoided, at least within the limited domain of the ethical life. But even there, I would say that there are limitations. For example, there might be pious Christian who observes very scrupulously the Christian principle of universal love, trying to develop love for all human beings. Of course, the Bible says love, or Christ says love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, actually the Old Testament says that too. But this person doesn't think twice about during a holiday, going hunting, going fishing, And then the person can hunt and fish on the holidays and after the holidays go to church and participate in religious services with no qualms of conscience at all. Other people can give, um, even be very religious and approve of sometimes very brutal wars if their side is involved in a war, let our side, our nation, triumph. We have to vanquish the enemy. doesn't matter. We kill them. They have (laughs) human beings, but they are just uh, blemishes on the earth. So let's eliminate them. And even some religions that teach that one should avoid things like stealing, adultery, but they teach absolution through confession, at least for some of the uh, transgressions or sins, so people think don't think twice about transgressing these principles of behavior. Then one goes to church on Sunday, confesses to the priest, he sprinkles some water, and then one is <laughs> absolved. One sins, what is this called? Remission of sins. One sins are forgiven. And so I would say that all the very minute explanations, the detailed explanations of what ways of action lead to unwholesome, to undesirable results, what ways of action lead to desirable results, are, I don't like to be boastful, but I would say that that's fairly exclusive to the Buddha's teaching. 
Okay, so then now the wise person, we're in paragraph 10. Okay, the wise person is one who knows these four ways of undertaking things. And so this person, he will avoid course number one, the way that is painful and ripens in future pain. This one will also avoid course two, the way of undertaking things that is pleasant now and ripens in future pain. This person will know that the way the way of undertaking things that is painful now and ripens in future happiness, number three. And so even though the way might be painful, difficult, challenging, but this person will rise to that challenge, will have the courage, determination to undertake this practice, this path. In the recognition, the confidence that it will lead to long-term happiness. For example, if you hear about the benefits of practicing meditation, and so maybe you see pictures of yogis sitting very tranquil and still with peaceful, sublime faces. Maybe you hear other people speaking very highly about the benefits of meditation. And then you sit down to practice and you think immediately you're going to zip into these states of high samadhi and three seconds have gone by. I'm not in it yet. Five seconds. Boy, it must be a full minute yet. Then. Um, was I supposed to focus on my breath? Is that what it is? <laughs> So the mind is wandering, 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 then unpleasant memories come up. I have to get rid of these. I'm thirsty. I've never been so thirsty before. It's been ten minutes already. <laughs> then <laughs> the stomach starts growling. <laughs> oh, I could use a bite. <laughs> I'm daydreaming about what's in the refrigerator. <laughs> And suddenly, skin starts itching and itching and itching. Never itched that way before. (laughs) Now, even though the meditation teacher said, don't look at the watch, we time the (laughs) watch here. Just one eye open a little bit. (laughs) Look at the watch. Twelve minutes. (laughs) And it's supposed to be... 40 minutes. <laughs> then after 18 minutes, a little pain starts, a little discomfort to the right knee. And the, the uh, back starts paining. But, okay, so it becomes at the beginning very uncomfortable. And maybe for a long, long time it's uncomfortable. But one recognizes that this is a way of practice that will bring benefit. And then sometimes while you're sitting, again the mind is race running, body itching, pain in the legs. But then maybe just for one or two seconds, suddenly the mind comes together, it settles down, and maybe stays with its object five, ten seconds, and then some some happiness or joy out of unexpectedly comes into the mind and gives kind of compensation or a confirmation of the value of this practice. And then as you continue week after week, month after month, year and after year, you find maybe immediately you're not getting into this blissful, rapturous state But in your day-to-day life, you can deal with situations more calmly, more effectively, more peacefully. You feel an inner happiness, inner glow in your daily life. And then this will confirm even more strongly the value of the practice. And this goes on till 
maybe at some point you can, with enough diligence and determined effort, enter into these states of joy and bliss and peace. Okay, so this is the way that's painful now, but ripens in future pleasure. And then the fourth, the wise person knows the way that is pleasant now and ripens in future pleasure. And so he will cultivate this way of undertaking things and not avoid it. And so because the wise person avoids the first two courses, the disagreeable things diminish. And because this person cultivates the third and fourth ways, then the desirable, pleasant, agreeable things will increase. Okay, so now, having laid out this basic schedule or outline, the Buddha will explain the specifically what are the four ways of undertaking things. And he does this with reference to a particular formula in his teaching, which is called, it's actually two contrasting formulas or lists numerical list. One is the ten unwholesome courses of action. This is an important classification, so I put it on the board. I put the poly on the board. Here, akusala, dasa means ten, akusala means unwholesome, kama is karma or action, and patta is just like the English word path. Both come from the same original stem, Indo-European, the same family, Indo-European family of languages. So it's ten paths or course ways of unwholesome action. And the opposite are the ten course ways, ten paths of wholesome action. And we meet these countless times in the suttas, in the Nikayas. And of the ten courses of unwholesome action, three are bodily. We speak about three doors of action. We call these Kama Dvara. Dvara, again, is like the English word door. It has the same etymological root. So the three doors of action are body, speech, and mind. Actually, in reality, all action, all comma, originates where? From which of the three doors? In the mind. But even though all comma originates in the mind, but comma expresses itself in different ways. And when comma originates in the mind, does anyone know the key word that signifies exactly what the comma is? What is that particular factor of mind or capacity of the mind? Volition. Volition. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a word which Originates, I think, from Latin, is it? In Pali, it's called Hesina. The Buddha says, in the Sutta, he says, it is Chaitana that I call action or karma. 
In other words, it is volition or intention that I call karma for having willed, thought out an action in the mind. Then one acts through body or speech or one just forms the thought. And so volition, the mental in, or the mental activity, sometimes it will express itself through the channel of the body. It will activate the body so that one engages in some physical action. Sometimes the act, the volition, that faculty, function of mind will activate speech. So one speaks in certain ways. And very often, one will have intentions, wishes, desires that don't express themselves in bodily and verbal action, but they just remain as thought. That is purely mental action. Okay, so there are ten courses of unwholesome action. And now one can engage in these un- courses of unwholesome action. Some people will engage in them with an unpleasurable state of mind. So someone in pain and grief kills living beings and experiences pain and grief that have the killing of living beings as conditions. Perhaps this could be somebody who is employed, say, in some of the armies, and actually even in armies today, one might be drafted into an army, conscripted, forced to kill, one doesn't want to kill, but still one goes along, one doesn't resist that, and so the mind feels pain, unhappiness, but one proceeds with the killing or somebody is forced into the occupation of a butcher or maybe one enjoys killing but at the time when actually engages in the killing then the mind even just temporarily experiences pain and discomfort and similarly with the others with Stealing, taking the belongings of others, um, engaging in sexual misconduct, speaking falsely. Oh, I, actually, I didn't really go through the ten courses of action. Okay, the, with regard to the body, there are three unwholesome courses of action. What are those three unwholesome courses of action? killing or destroying life. That is a volition, the act of mind that motivates the person to physically engage in the act of killing. Generally, the act of killing is done physically. But not only physically, It's also recognized that the act of killing can be committed verbally. For example, I have perfectly clean hands. I've never touched, killed a soul in my life, even though I am the dictator of a totalitarian dictator. So I order my secret police, take this man (laughs) in the back, get rid of him. I round up all of the miscreants in the kingdom and bring them up and the king sits on his throne and says to his the executors take this one off with his head off with his head off with his head so this person is (coughs) okay so this person is one who is killing but not using the body, using speech, 
But still it's considered a bodily action because the act of killing generally is done with the body. Okay, stealing also is the second bodily um, transgression. So one could steal verbally, for example, the mastermind who plans the theft, the break-in, doesn't go to the bank himself and participate in the crime. He just sits in his hideout in his office waiting for the others to come back with the loot. Then he'll take the lion's share since he is the, the brains behind the operation. But because he speaks, he's committing theft and theft is generally considered a bodily action. The misconduct with regard to sensual pleasures it seems generally that has to be committed bodily. <laughs> so, so. Okay, then, okay, so there are three types of unwholesome action with the body, then four types of unwholesome action with speech. What are the four types with speech? Lying, speaking falsehood. In a sense, one could also speak falsehood bodily by writing a letter in which you tell a lot of lies to get a promotion at work, you falsify your previous work experience, your credentials, you write it, type it. But even though that's a bodily action, but since communication is involved, it's considered a verbal action. So, um, also, the next is malicious speech. This means speaking words that are intended to divide people who are in friendly, harmonious relations. We'll find them defined more fully when we come to some other suttas. Then harsh speech, speaking in ways that hurt the feelings of others, anger, speaking angrily to others being sharply critical of others without the intention of benefiting them. And then just engaging in idle chatter, gossip. Again, all of these can be done either by directly by speech or by writing. I guess mute people could all use hand signals to convey falsehood or to slander or to perhaps even to utter harsh, harsh speech. But the gossip, I guess they also gossip using hand signals. And then the third, the, the, the last three, eight, nine, and ten, remain purely mental. These are covetousness, which means desiring, actually desiring to gain possession of the belongings of others. Covetousness here is stronger than simple greed. Greed is simply that you want to get things to enjoy for yourself. And greed itself is unwholesome, but it's not an unwholesome course of action. I'll explain what's specifically meant by course of action in a moment. Okay, the next is the mind of ill will, but to be a course of action, kamapatha, the mind of ill will, it has to be something stronger than mere anger or dislike. That's also ill will, but the ill will, which is a kamapatha, course of action, is the mind of ill will that actually wishes for the harm of somebody else, that wishes to inflict pain and suffering on another. Like one has a person that one is very friendly with, and maybe even then one has some disagreement with that person, and then you feel angry at that person. Even the person so upsets you, maybe you have some heated political disagreement, and so you don't want to talk to that person. You want to avoid that person. 
And so you could say you have will, ill will towards your friend. But then if the thought comes, would I really want my friend to get seriously sick, to die? No, if you care, the word comes that your friend now has fallen sick, even though you haven't been speaking to each other for a week, but you go for the telephone, call up, speak to his family, ask how he is, if it's all right for you to come over to visit, and you go over and visit, and all of the differences dissolve in your Buddy, buddy again. A hot political disagreement is forgotten. And in that case, the feeling that you had to that person, it was ill will, it's unwholesome, but it's not a course of karma. It's, but when it's, there's a person you really dislike and you want that person to, to fall out of the picture, but to drop off, is that the expression they use? to die but <laughs> so you really want that person to suffer to make somebody suffer then that is the course of karma it's a ill will that becomes a course of karma and then the last one is wrong view which means as a course of karma it's specifically a wrong view that denies the principle, the law of karma and its fruit, which denies that ethical actions, moral actions, have any consequences beyond those that are visible here and now, that they produce results for their agent in some future existence. Okay, now the specific defining factor is a distinction between a course of karma and a simple karmic action. A course of karma, in Pali, a kamapatta, is an action which is capable of taking over the role of generating rebirth. In the course of our lives, we perform many, many actions. And some of, many, most of these actions, if they're actions of moral significance, ethical significance, they all deposit a fruit or or a, a power in the mind, some kind of energy in the mind, with the capacity to produce results in the future, some karmic fruit in the future. But most of these actions are too weak to generate the rebirth. But of the many actions we perform, some of these actions will be of the type that are powerful enough to generate rebirth. And those actions which are capable of generating rebirth are kamapattas. And so those actions are classified in these ten basic categories. And of the ten, they fall into, apart from this distinction between bodily, verbal, and mental, they fall into three other groups. One is concerned with the domain of ethics. The second is concerned with the domain of mental purification. The third is concerned with the domain of wisdom. The first seven all belong to the domain of ethics. Okay, so the three domains are sila, or ethics, citta, or mind, and here, ditti, which means view. And so a person who is 
engaging in the seven unwholesome types of behavior has you call sila vipatti, which means deficiency or even we could say corruption of virtue, corruption of morality. That means sila vipatti. Whereas a person who conforms to these ethical principles is successful in ethics, in ethical observance. That would be sila sampati. In the case of a person who is prone to possessiveness and ill will, that, but doesn't act on those impulses. So those are the domain of mind, chitta. And this person is corrupted or deficient in mind. So that's chitta vipati. But a person who is relatively free from possessiveness and ill will is, you could say, successful in mind or developed in mind, accomplished in mind. Chita Sampati. Then the person who holds the wrong view is Ditti Vipati, deficient in view or understanding, corrupted in understanding, whereas the person who has the right view is ditti sampati, successful or accomplished in view, accomplished in understanding, successful in understanding. Okay, I think I should stop here. And next time I will finish this sutta. I don't think it will take long to finish because once we lay out the basic principles, as I've been doing today, then the rest just follows almost in a matter of course. And then, as I expect to finish this sutta next time, then we will take sutta number 57. That is, let me show it to the right one. Yeah, this will be a little amusing at the beginning, a touch of humor here. The Kukura Vatika Sutta, the dog duty ascetic. And Sharon, don't bring your dogs next week. <laughs> what? Dog. <laughs> I don't mean dog duty in that sense. <laughs> okay, any questions? Comments? Yeah. Yeah. That is so, that is so. That is so. But at first one has to see. Then one has to train oneself in accordance with one's um, insight or understanding. But it does take more than just seeing or understanding, but one has to make an effort of training. In fact, there's all, at the beginning there's very often this conflict. One recognizes that something is leading to one's benefit, but if it's difficult to undertake, then the mind finds inconceivable ways to get around it. <laughs> Puts up all sorts of excuses. So, yeah. I mean, actions that one has put, committed in the past. There's no way to actually undo those that, that action that's already been done. That action is there. But what one can do is, in a sense, dilute it by engaging in wholesome types of action which will counteract and weaken the force of those wholesome of those unwholesome actions so that they don't have much opportunity to come to the forefront and play the role of generating rebirth. We might compare this actually the simile comes from a sutra. In the case of, say, a person who's habitually engaged in unwholesome actions, who has a bad character, untrained character, 
Then an unwholesome action is like having a glass of water and one drops a <clears throat> lump of salt into it. The water, after a few minutes, will become salty. So that one drop of salt or one lump of salt put into the cup of water has a very discernible effect upon the taste of the water. But if you have, say, a big bucket of water and you put the lump of salt into the bucket of water and stir it up, then sip the water, you don't get any taste of salt at all or just very, very slight flavor. And so if a person has done unwholesome actions in the past and the Buddha had a disciple named Angulimala who even was said to have killed close to a thousand people, cut off their fingers. But he was converted by the Buddha, he became a monk, and eventually became an arahant, the liberated one. And many others have, after leading a very undisciplined life, then they embrace the Dharma, and then by leading a good life, one, we could say, speaking metaphorically, deposits lumps and lumps and lumps of wholesome karma into the mind. It's like taking the lump of salt and in the cup and then keep on, you put that into a big bucket and then keep on pouring more and more sweet water into the bucket until one can hardly taste the salt at all. It's like, so then if that unwholesome karma gets an opportunity to ripen, the effect will be very weak. Any further questions? A good question. Technically, they're actually very, very close. Actually, right, right, right. Actually, my mind was a little bit drifting. Um, within the, you see, the word sankara has different meanings in different contexts. Okay, as now we get up to a, a big topic. <laughs> but Sankara in its most general usage can mean all conditioned phenomena. Anything made by causes and conditions is a Sankara. Sometimes this is translated condition formation. So everything, the clock is a Sankara, book is a Sankara, the table is a Sankara, um, the body is a sankara. All my feelings, thoughts, perceptions, all of them are sankaras. Everything within the universe that's conditioned, composite, dependent upon causes, sankara. But then sankara has a more specific meaning as one of the five aggregates, the fourth aggregate. Um, so this is the aggregate, which includes the sometimes translated mental formations, I use volitional formations. This includes all types of mental factors except feeling and perception, which are aggregates of their own. But then, sometimes, and this is specifically in the case formula for dependent origination, avijja pachaya sankara, sankara pachaya vinyanam. In that formula, Sankaras, volitional formations, are identical with Chaitanya, with volition. So Chaitanya and Sankara are synonymous in that context. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, a good way to put it. So also I think we could see Sankaras as being responsible for the results too. In fact, um, Let's put off your question till next week because in the sutta that we're going to take next week, the dog duty ascetic sutta, the word sankara plays a major role there. So then we will discuss the word in that context. Okay, it's getting, actually, it's gotten quite late now. So we will stop and then continue next week. I hope next week I could sing... Welcome, sweet springtime, we greet thee with song. But the birds are a singing, flowers are blooming.
<laughs> okay. Dedicate the mirror, share the mirror. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika bunyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu sa sanang. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika bunyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu de sanang. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika Punyantang anumodipa, tirangra kanto tang sadang.